Good afternoon. Uh, well done with my name. Obviously, a Kwasi Awusubepa, people often struggle. <laughs> uh, like the other um, presenters, I'd like to first say um, thank you for the uh, invitation to be here. Um, and thank you for the great lunch. I've got to say I ate so much that I feel like I'm going to fall asleep during my own presentation. Hopefully that doesn't happen, and hopefully none of you fall asleep as well. So uh, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto, trained as a criminologist, uh, now teaching in a department of sociology. Uh, the majority of my work focuses on the intersections of race, crime, and criminal justice. You can't study race and justice work without focusing on drugs. Uh, if you don't know this already, check out the HBO's The Wire. It'll fill you in. Five seasons, the best sociology that's been done. I see some giggles amongst the, uh, some of the academics. Uh, I also serve as the uh, Director of Research for Cannabis Amnesty. Uh, we're an organization that's lobbying the government to erase the criminal records of people who've been convicted of cannabis-related crimes that are no longer illegal. Thank you. I see uh, one of my colleagues at the campaign in the room uh, here, and I've got to say, getting into the conflicts of interest, uh, we at the campaign have taken uh, generous support from Aurora Cannabis, uh, Doja, as well as Hexo, and I'd like to thank them for uh, their sponsorship and their support, not only financial, but in terms of uh, navigating the logistics of uh, the political uh, framework that is this country, and I've also uh, done some consulting work for the responsible cannabis user and, and Can We Growers. So uh, I'm talking about uh, race and justice, particularly in the context of uh, the Canadian war on drugs. Now here in Canada, unlike the United States, we do not collect race, racially disaggregated data across a, a number of different social institutions or social spheres, not only in the criminal justice context, uh, I know there are a number of healthcare providers, physicians and otherwise in the room. Uh, you might have seen this recent article in the Globe and Mail talking about the dearth of uh, racially disaggregated data or racially relevant data in our healthcare system and the impact that this has on the delivery of healthcare in this country. Now, this is not limited to health. The same thing applies to the criminal justice context, which makes it very difficult to identify the types of problems that we have that are very similar to those that exist in the United States related to uh, the criminalization of people for the not only possession, but of course uh, also um, trafficking and uh, production of drugs. I say here, no data, no problem. That's not quite the case, as I'm going to illuminate shortly. So I'll get it. <laughs> My main, uh, I, I teach a few times a week, I have to do that on a weekly basis in class. Uh, my main argument here is that the uh, war on drugs and the racialized nature of the war on drugs has not been a strictly American problem. And this is something that uh, is a, a bit of a surprise to many Canadians. Uh, we have a, a racialized mass incarceration problem here. 7% um, of black males between the ages of uh, 18 and 35 experienced incarceration in 2010. 7.4%, okay? That's not an insignificant number. Part of that comes from the racialized nature of drug law enforcement. The limited availability of racially disaggregated criminal justice data and policing data in particular is part of the problem here because we can't uh, not only identify but acknowledge and work towards dealing with the issues that we have. Now, our Canadian policing agencies are not really excited about or... or, or um, willing to share the, the data that they collect. So uh, police collect data in a number of different instances, not only when they arrest individuals, but when they come into contact with them. Folks in Toronto will have seen the, the debates around police carding. Uh, I know this is the case. Police fill out race in the forms that they uh, fill out when they interact with civilians, but they don't make this data available uh, to policymakers, to researchers, or to the general public. So uh, colleagues and I have had to work with uh, journalists who are uh, skilled at filing freedom of and access to information requests to get access to the data that's collected by police agencies and other justice agencies but not typically released. We've done some work with the Toronto Star as well as a national project with Vice News and this is some of the data that I'm going to be sharing with you shortly. And what we find is that when we look at the data from six Canadian cities, six large Canadian cities, the situation with respect to race and cannabis law enforcement is very similar to that in the United States. That is that black and indigenous people are greatly overrepresented in those arrests. 
So as a bit of a background for folks, um, I've, I've got to say I've been studying, like I've been interested in cannabis, well, I was going to say since undergrad, perhaps a little bit before undergrad, but studying it since undergrad. And I must say um, there were some significant changes happening at that time with regards to access medicinally, but I certainly wouldn't have thought that we'd be in the situation we are now where we have this uh, regulated legal market. Um, but our, our war on drugs and our war on cannabis is an established one. Uh, Canada is not only at the forefront of legalization, but we were at the forefront of criminalization. And there was a, a, a racialized nature to this criminalization. First and foremost was the Opium Act. Uh, this came about in 1908, not long after the uh, completion of the Canadian Pacific Railroad. There was an abundance of Chinese labor that had been imported to help build the railroad, and they were seen as competition for white labor. Um, the use of opium, although relatively, you know, wide, not widespread, but uh, not unusual a a across the country and across different racial groups in the country, was associated with the Chinese population, subsequently outlawed, and they were targeted for its use so that they could be controlled. Cannabis was unexpectedly criminalized in 1923. In fact, people studying um, the criminalization have, have called it a solution in search of a problem. There didn't seem to be uh, much in the way of a cannabis uh, uh, or a, a use uh, problem, yet the Americans were criminalizing the substance, again, largely based on fears of Mexican immigrants and the associated use with Mexicans, and we followed suit. Now, we've had this kind of odd relationship in terms of uh, prohibition in Canada, and it's ebbed and flowed. Um, there were very few in the way of arrests up through the 1950s, and we didn't really see this major surge until the 1960s. Uh, and then we have the Ladane Commission, for those that are not aware, the Ladane Commission on the use of uh, non-medicinal drugs, which was a comprehensive study on the use, non-medicinal use, pardon me, of drugs, which included uh, a lot of work around cannabis and ultimately recommended that cannabis should be uh, decriminalized and the government should get into the business of, of providing it to, to Canadians. Uh, that didn't happen, obviously. Uh, and we saw this uh, kind of resurgence of criminalization throughout the 1980s and 1990s, and especially with the introduction of the Controlled uh, Drugs and Substances Act in the 1990s. It's a nice little uh, chart here, just uh, kind of tracking uh, rates of arrests. These are uh, rates per 100,000 population, and you can see this kind of decline, as I said, into the 1990s, and then uh, increasing up through uh, to the, the mid-2010s. Um, the blue bars, the total arrests, um, oranges possession, gray supplies. We can see drug possession arrests uh, count for a substantial number of the arrests for cannabis-related crimes. Uh, I often ask my intro to crim class, how many people like cannabis and hands shoot up, right? Canadian youth use at amongst the highest uh, rates in the developed world. We know that Canadians have a fondness for cannabis, and the police have not been reluctant to criminalize people for its possession. Unfortunately, that criminalization has not been applied equally across groups. So as I've noted, we lack access to the data that we should have in order to evaluate uh, what's happening properly. Uh, Jim Rankin, a great friend of mine and reporter at the Toronto Star, has done much to advance our knowledge. Um, starting, and this is a very interesting story, starting in about 2013, 2014, he and I started um, asking the Toronto Police Service for access to racially desegregated uh, arrest data. Um, they took a while to get it to us, waited for Blair to kind of exit from and be elected uh, MP before they released it. But what we saw from that was that although blacks uh, represent just 8.4% of Toronto's population, they accounted for a quarter of people arrested for cannabis possession. In contrast to white, Canadian, white Torontonians who were arrested at rates that were similar to their representation in the general population. Now, unfortunately, this, this um, Data did not include any information about Indigenous people, which, of course, in the Canadian context is a huge shortcoming. So we worked with Rachel Brown from Vice News to gain access to, again, through freedom of information laws, to access to uh, police arrest data from five cities across the country. I'm doing the same thing as Rebecca. You guys are way easier to look at than you guys. So I apologize as well. I think it's where my uh, comfort screen, this is supposed to make me feel comfortable in a room of 500 people, but it's where my comfort screen is placed, so I do apologize. We got the data through uh, Freedom of Information, and we looked at only at uh, charges for simple possession. And the reason for that is because of the great amount of discretion that the police have in uh, pursuing charges for something like possession. So every day in this country, prior to the legalization of cannabis, the police would encounter uh, individuals in possession of cannabis, 
uh, and they could decide that they wanted to pursue formal charges and charge and arrest them, uh, arrest and charge them, or they could let them go. And so uh, the police exercise their discretion differently with different groups. If you're rude, they're less likely to um, exercise positive discretion. Uh, perhaps if you're young, uh, and we know also that if you're racialized. And so this allowed us to, we couldn't directly test for discrimination, but it, it gave us a better idea of, of uh, how things were playing out. So I'm going to go through, uh, I, I use uh, Vice's, I'm taking this right from the, the Vice series that was produced from the, um, the data that we obtained. My graduate student, Alex Luscombe, or a student that I worked with, Alex Luscombe and I, worked with Rachel Brown and the team at Vice to analyze this data. And we can see, and I'm actually going to read uh, another form of data, but these, these uh, charts, what you can see is the bars are the uh, percent of uh, arrests, and the lines going across are the representation of those groups in the general population. So Vancouver, you can see the gray line going across the top. Uh, the black and the yellow lines at the bottom, you can barely see. But when you look at the bars, you see that uh, Indigenous people, for example, while constituting 2.5% of Vancouver's population in 2015, were 17% of the arrests. Uh, in fact, based on their representation in the general population, uh, Indigenous people were six times um, more likely to be arrested than their representation in the general population would suggest. Blacks likewise being four times overrepresented in these arrests. When we move across the country, unfortunately we see a very similar picture emerge. Likewise, the overrepresentation of black people and indigenous people in Edmonton, in Calgary, I don't have all of the slides up, likewise in Regina, in Ottawa, and in Halifax. And in fact, in, while Indigenous people were most overrepresented in the data in the Vancouver data set, it was blacks in, uh, in the Halifax data. So I argue, and, and I like saying this, I think cannabis is a gateway drug. And people are like, oh, what do you mean? And I mean, not a gateway to harder drug use. I think milk's a gateway drug. Most people that have used you know, hard drugs have drank milk at some point in time. <laughs> but uh, a gateway into the criminal justice system, right? So cannabis being a relatively common and minor crime is one for which not everybody has the benefit of not, being, um, not having charges pursued uh, for them for. Cannabis is a gateway into the criminal justice system for members of our most marginalized populations as well as uh, many racialized folks. And uh, Bill Blair has acknowledged this. Justin Trudeau has acknowledged this. Uh, unfortunately, not everyone has the privilege that Justin Trudeau has. Uh, he admitted to smoking cannabis while sitting as an MP, and he used that as part of his platform to be elected prime minister of the country. He also recounted a story of his brother being arrested after getting in a car accident in possession of cannabis, and his father leveraging his political and legal connections to get those charges dropped. Now, not everyone has that same political, legal, or economic power. And so we know that these racially disparate arrests contribute to the criminalization of those populations, you know, particularly the young uh, black and indigenous men that I work with. And as a gateway drug, an individual who uh, gets arrested for a minor cannabis uh, possession offense, even if they're not charged, that's going to show up and they're going to become known to police. So if they subsequently get caught doing something wrong, they don't benefit from having a clean record, right? And if charges are pursued and they go to court, they have a social debt, and these things seem, uh, start to mount. Your criminal record, of course, affects a number of things. The likelihood that you can gain um, student loans in some contexts, uh, access to school, right, employment, housing, and it affects both physical and mental health, as does the concentration of incarceration. So very few people are going to be behind bars for having got caught in possession of cannabis. But as I've said, if that increases the chances of you being criminalized for later behavior, we see how that serves to concentrate incarceration amongst those people who are criminalized for doing something that many of us do. So we're now in the post-legal era, and some folks are like, okay, cannabis is legal now, we don't have these problems to deal with anymore. And that's categorically wrong. There are actually more laws around the cannabis plant now than there were before legalization. And what we see from the US, and I should say that I've got to move California from the decriminalized into the legalized, but most of the data we have, have is from the kind of de facto uh, decriminalization of cannabis in California, is that while overall arrests for cannabis-related offenses are down, the racial disparities actually grow. So again, the police have uh, the potential to exercise discretion. So we can see areas that this would happen. So we can think about the increased charges, for example, uh, the, and the harsh penalties for trafficking to a minor. 
So an 18-year-old who passes a joint to a 17-year-old potentially could face you know, extremely severe penalties, uh, and if they're a non-citizen, deportation. We've got strength in laws around uh, cannabis-impaired driving. I'm not opposed to that, but we need to think about who it is that those laws are enforced against or who's disproportionately likely to um, be arrested and subsequently you know, uh, criminalized for those offenses. And then we've got the whole, you know, the fact that there's illicit cannabis. So there's illicit cannabis. If I wanted to buy recreational cannabis now in this province, I would have to buy it from the Ontario Cannabis Store, meaning that I would have to have a credit card. If I'm a marginalized person who doesn't have a credit card, I'm de facto, unless I want to go through the trouble of taking cash to a bank, buying a prepaid visa, and then going back to my home, presuming I have internet to buy the weed online, and a mailbox to send it to, forced to go to that quote-unquote illicit market. And so we can again see how marginalization can contribute to the criminalization of these groups. And we see this very clearly in American jurisdictions, most notably Colorado. So I think moving forward, and, and I'm quite happy actually that there are uh, quite a number of industry folks in here and not only um, medical folks and researchers because I think a lot of uh, the ways in which we can move this forward is with industry. So first and foremost, as I, I said when I started off uh, speaking today, that I'm, I'm part of the campaign for cannabis amnesty. And whereas I've noted lobbying the government to erase the criminal records of people who've been convicted of crimes that are no longer illegal. Now the government has tabled a pardons bill uh, unfortunately, we don't think that goes far enough. I won't bore you with too many of the details, but at the moment, we have a record suspension system, meaning that an individual who gets a quote-unquote pardon for one of these offenses um, would have their record simply say that they've been pardoned. It would still exist. If another government were to come into power and decide that the pardons or legalization generally, probably not going to happen, but the pardons were not a good idea, that could be reversed. If the person was deemed to be not of good character for some reason, that could be reversed. What we're arguing for is expungement. Expungement is a complete erasure of those criminal records, and it's really a signal from the government that it was wrong to criminalize the behavior in the first place. While a pardon is basically forgiveness for having done something wrong, as I've noted, expungement is the government saying that we shouldn't have criminalized your behavior, and they've done so. They won't, they're not forthcoming with pardons for two reasons. One, because of their shoddy record keeping, so they don't actually know where the criminal records are held and they haven't properly documented who's been convicted of what crime. So plausibly individuals who've been convicted of per, uh, trafficking, uh, possession for the purpose of tra trafficking are lumped together with simple possession. But they also don't want to recognize that there's been a profound historic injustice. And I think that's an ignorant on the part of, of Ralph Goodell, on the part of Bill Blair, on the part of Justin Trudeau, to not fully acknowledge how we got to where we are now in terms of the racialized nature of our drug laws <laughs> and how those have been enforced. Thank you. What I think we should also see is a redistribution of the tax revenue from the sales of legal cannabis back into the communities that have been most harmed by prohibition. So we've had a scenario where we spent 100 years criminalizing this substance and the people who get found in possession of it. We've spent literally billions of dollars on police, on courts and corrections, instead of schools, on hospitals and community centers. This is money that's been taken from our most vulnerable communities and given to our criminal justice actors. And so we should be taking a portion of, as they are in some American jurisdictions, the tax revenue and directing it back into those communities that have been most harmed by prohibition. And that's not a difficult thing to do. If you can get access to the police data, it's geocoded. You simply run that through a GIS statistical program thingy that I'm not really aware of because, like Rebecca, I do more qualitative work. But you can find very clearly the neighborhoods that have been most effective. And finally, uh, enhancing the participation of people who've also been criminalized in industry. And I think the best example of where this has been done is in Massachusetts. So um, we've done a decent job here, but in, in some contexts, individuals who have criminal records for cannabis-related offenses lack access to certain parts of the industry. So. We've, you know, incar we've criminalized and incarcerated a group of people for doing something, and then we deny them access to benefit from its newfound legal status. And I find this particularly offensive when we have people like Julian Fantino, who were responsible for that criminalization, now running licensed cannabis companies, right? Or running companies in the industry. It's not just the licensed companies, but also other players in the industry. And there are no shortage of this. I have no problem with their participation, as long as the people that they criminalize are not only allowed or provided access, but also provided a preferential access. So what they're doing in Massachusetts, for example, is anyone who has a criminal record for a drug-related offense 
or who can show that they've lived in a neighborhood that's been over police for a certain amount of time has access to a preferential category of license. And this is not a perfect scheme by any means, but it does, as I, I note, start to repair, repair part of me, some of the harms of prohibition. I think government can do a good job. We have some tiered licensing here, and I'd like to see more of that, not only tiered licensing, but as I said, uh, targeted licensing. But I think also industry can help by um, not only uh, incorporating similar measures into their CSR, and, and, and many uh, companies are now doing a, a good job of um, developing CSR in initiatives, some in collaboration with communities that have been harmed, uh, to try and repair some of these harms, but also by fostering an inclusive industry. So if we look at, at the, the leaders of, of most of the main players in this industry at the moment, they're largely white and they're largely male. And that's not going to be surprising. You needed a large amount of capital to get into the industry and you and oftentimes also needed, if it weren't political connections, an ability to maneuver through the licensing system, which was, a, I don't want to say a nightmare, but a very difficult thing to do. Those criminalized folks whose life chances had been harmed did not have the capital necessarily or the know-how to do that. So it's not a surprise that the industry looks as it does now. But uh, we can think about things like targeted mentoring programs, like the diversity initiatives, like uh, partnerships with college programs, the very types of things that will be able to bring those who've been historically harmed together with the communities to build. We know from the literature that diversity is uh, advantageous for companies irrespective of industry. And I've been heartened to see when I've toured facilities and, and, and been into offices that the staff are actually quite diverse, but I think there, there's always more that can be done. And then of course, um, and this, was, this is more for uh, those folks in the research and, and, and practice areas, uh, we need much more in the way of data. So we've got a number of different um, data collection mechanisms. I like the Stats Cannabis, our federal statistical agency focusing on cannabis, and there are a number of surveys that collect data on use and how cannabis is used, uh, but we don't collect data, unfortunately, that relates to race and ethnicity in relation to these things. And then also, um, with respect, of course, to criminal justice institutions. As I've noted, uh, I don't think that the racial disparities are going to go away, and so if we want to keep on top of that, we need to collect adequate data in order to do so. So that's that. Thank you very much, and I welcome questions. <laughs>